starting with the entrepreneur or the hiring manager, they assess themselves and they go, oh my gosh, I'm working outside of my my MO. I'm working outside of my strengths all the time. And now I see why I'm so stressed out. These are the things I need to get off my plate. You're listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with your host, Michael Palmer. Listen each week as inspiring guests share their secrets of success to help you increase your confidence, work smarter, and build a business you love. This episode of The Successful Bookkeeper is brought to you by purebookkeeping.com, the proven system to grow your bookkeeping business. Welcome back to the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Palmer, and today's show is going to be a good one. Our guest is the founder of Lead with Harmony, which supports small business owners in achieving their business growth, hiring, and team development goals. Andrea McKenzie, welcome to the show. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to have you. It's great to have you and always love having new guests and new friends of the Successful Bookkeeper podcast. So it's great to have you. But uh, I really want our listener to learn about who you are. So please tell us a little bit about you and your career journey leading up to this point. Sure. Yeah. So my business, as you said, is called Lead with Harmony. At this point, my focus is really to help small business owners to hire develop and lead a great team. And what sort of happened lately is hiring has become such a big focus and it's such a huge opportunity for people when they have the opportunity to hire. It's It, it affects everything. It affects the ability to develop the rest of your team. It affects um, you know how people are able to put their leadership skills into place, what they can delegate, all that kind of stuff. So like something along the lines of like 90% of, of people problems in an organization stem from hiring. So I spend a lot of time helping people hire, but then if you're not hiring, there's so much to look at in terms of the current team, aligning people in the right roles, making sure you're very clear about expectations and so on. Um, my journey um, really is as somebody who I came out of undergrad with a music degree <laughs> and, you know, I really loved going to school for music, but coming out with a music degree, I can say that people looked at my resume and underestimated what I was capable of. And I would say one of my big models is to really look beyond the resume and, and see people for like really all of what they bring to the table. I went back for my MBA because I didn't want to move from lateral job to lateral job for the rest of my life. Came out, went into consulting because that's where you just sort of sink or swim and do everything. I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I grew up. And then about 10 years ago, I went out on my own. And when I did, I got myself a business coach. Somebody said, hey, you might be able to use a coach. I kind of rolled my eyes at the idea, like, Ugh, <laughs> what is a coach? <laughs> and it changed everything for me. So that's where I decided to kind of mesh. I, I went back and got a certification as a coach to learn that modality. And now I just sort of combine everything that I've done from, you know, really leading teams and consulting, taking that work and understanding how teams work, why they have dysfunction, that kind of thing, and sort of bringing in the consulting, training, and coaching all into one to help help people lead teams. Wow. Yeah. Such a cool, and we were chatting actually before the episode started, and you've, you've done a lot of different things. And I, I love the, <laughs> I love that story about the, the music. People look at your resume and they're like, you got music, eh? Like what's, you know, it's amazing because all the people that I know that play music are super bright people. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I would say everyone <laughs> who plays music is a bright person. You probably surround yourself with really bright well, people who have to play music, but yeah. I, th- I, I mean, would I say, think- sorry, I did. I probably <laughs> misspoke. Anybody that's gone to school for music uh, are typically really bright people and hardworking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, so it's, it's not an easy... Like- yeah, it's a bad, bad, bad branding for the for the music degrees. But obviously, people I think think well, you know, then that's part of the hiring process, and and we'll get into that, I'm sure. But 
what they're looking at and not really knowing how to evaluate what they're even seeing on a resume, uh, just like yourselves. Like someone went to school for music. What does that really mean? Did they want to be in a band? Did they want to not, yes, you know, did, did, yes. did they just want to hang on their drum all day? Yes. Uh, you know, it's like a mis, mis, a misinterpretation of that whole education process. I know people, lots of them, who went to school for music and they would tell you the same story us the same story. Uh, but I know how hard they worked, how committed they were, how passionate they were. And they were eclectic people. They liked, it, they liked other things. And most of them had to pivot to other things, which is interesting. But getting back to you and your journey, you've done lots of different things. And, and I also love your, your coaching story, how, you've, how you discovered coaching. I think it's a, a really powerful message because many people, I think, would roll their eyes at the thought of it. I'm really curious, what had you roll your eyes when you thought of coaching? What was your context coming into that from, from yeah. pre- previous to that? <laughs> I think, oh, this is horrible because, you know, I, I, this, well, it's one of the reasons why I don't often lead with I'm a coach because I think that it's loaded and I think there's a lot of, it's not super regulated. There are people who are therapists who call themselves coaches. Like there's lots of, it's not really defined. And someone said to me, <laughs> the way they put it was, oh, you should talk to my life coach. And I was like, life coach? I don't know. There was just something about life coach. Like, really? I'm not, I don't have everything I need right now to live my life. <laughs> I don't know. There was just some, I don't know. I mean, I'm from the Boston area. Maybe I'm a little, was a little bit cynical from, <laughs> from, my, from my upbringing. I don't know. But I just, I, I really was like, and then the person who was telling me was somebody who I really trusted. And she's like, no, just, just do it. You know? And I was like, I'll try anything once. So yeah, I, I don't know why I had just, I thought it was, I don't know. It's terrible. It's terrible. I had a, a misconception about really like, how is someone going to help me that way? And then when I ex- understood, when I actually experienced it, I was like, oh my gosh, it is actually, no matter who you're working with, it really does turn into holistic life coaching. Even if you're working with a business coach or a sales coach or something, it all comes down to what you're really, what's going on in your mind, the power of how you think, your mindset. You know, there are a lot of really bad coaches. There's just like there's a lot of people bad at any profession, oh, right? There's so many um, parallels but, in your story yeah. with the with the bookkeeping industry. I mean, uh, I there's a lot of bookkeepers today and probably for, for a long time that they don't want to leave with bookkeeping, right? Because bookkeeping is very unre- unregulated industry. There's lots of bad players in the in the business mm-hmm. in the is the in the industry in the marketplace, right? And and so it's you know the journey, the pathway there for you was through a referral, right? Someone you trusted who said, "Hey, do this coaching." I'm serious, and you're like, oh, "I don't know." It's like I've had you know I have this misconception or not misconception at that time. It was like this is my really what am I going to get? They show me how to chew a pack of gum. Uh, this is this is very powerful to be thinking about uh, for a few reasons. Number one, the whole concept of understanding our own perceptions and how they could be incorrect. Uh, and that's for the bookkeeper thinking about getting a coach, right? If you're ro- if many of them probably roll up, I've been told there's so many in our industry that have worked with great coaches and it's transformed their lives and their businesses. Mm-hmm. But the other thing too is, is knowing that how other people in their industry, their, their clients might perceive them. And at the end of the day, you're, they're a bookkeeper, right? You're going to do the bookkeeping. It's not like they're going to, we're not, we're going to hide the fact that we have to do your bookkeeping, but how you lead with it, how you start conversations and what you talk about certainly is powerful and different, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and addressing those objections and understanding those misconceptions right off the bat, you know, I'm not just going to do your books. I'm going to, you know, help you solve X, Y, Z, right? They're, you're going to get time back. You're going to understand how to read this, right? I'm not, you know, whatever those things are that you're going to solve for the, for the business owner, the problems, I mean, it's marketing, you know, it's, it's just saying bookkeeping is not as enticing as I'm going to change your life. <laughs> you know, I'm going to change how you, you know, how you work or what, you know, how much time you have in a day or, you know, that kind of thing. So that's right. 
It's that time of year again. And after a great showing in 2021, the successful Bookkeeper Summit returns even bigger and better. It's a two-day virtual conference that features incredible speakers from the bookkeeping, accounting, and business world, such as value pricing expert Ron Baker and Joe Woodard of the Woodard Group. And that's just to name a few. The theme of this year's event is Make It Grow. And there's no doubt the content you'll consume will help you achieve more success than you ever thought possible. It all begins on November 9th, 2022. To secure your free spot, visit thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com forward slash summit. And again, that's thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com forward slash summit. Register today and I'll see you at the summit. And now let's get back to our interview. So now really interesting journey getting to the work that you're doing, but the work that you're doing is also a very highly talked about area because many of our audience and listeners, the listener right now might be saying hiring, get, get to the point, Michael. I need to hire people. There's no shortage of work in the marketplace. There is a shortage of people to do the work. And so hiring can be really challenging and it's really needed in our industry. And I'd love to get some, like, where should we start? Like mistakes people are making. I mean, they're making mistakes. They're having trouble finding people. They're having trouble evaluating them. What, what are the, the common ones you come across? Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of, mistakes or things not to do. I think the most common things I see are, you know, hiring the first available or hiring, I just need a smart person kind of thing. And then throwing the entire kitchen sink at them and just being like, well, this needs to get done and this needs to get done or making up the role as you go, not hiring someone to a clear set of expectations, not hiring someone with the knowledge of who they are in terms of what they want, know, and do um, it's just not ha- really, I see, it's crazy how many times I see somebody's like, oh, well, my, uh, my cousin's daughter is getting out of college. I'm just going to hire her. She seems smart. You know, it's like, no, right now you've got somebody you might really ruin a relationship with over hiring. So I think that's one thing. And the second thing is on a more positive way of looking at it is you have a process for bringing in clients. And it's not all that different from bringing in an employee when you're, again, this idea of marketing, like what is your brand? What do you, when you bring in this employee, what are you offering them in terms of who you are, your brand, what experience are they going to have as an employee? Um, And then also qualifying them. You qualify your clients. How do you qualify this person that you bring in as an employee? Because those people, I highly subscribe to the Richard Branson concept of treat your employees better than your clients, really getting that in people's minds. It's like they're the ones are going to take care of your clients, especially if you're the business owner, you want to start to step away at some point. You want to make sure you have the best of the best um, dealing with your your clients. Why do you think people not make it to the best of the best. Like it's, it, 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 it's not often that I hear people say, oh, you know what? I have the best of the best team uh, in my business. Uh, do you find that that's the case with some of the companies you begin with working with, or is there something that stops people from going that far? Uh, yeah, I think the number one thing is fear of investing uh, the right amount of money, time, effort, all of it into employees Again, <laughs> thinking of the client first rather than the employee first, like, well, I got to deal with all these clients. I'm just going to hire this person at the cheapest rate I can to get X, Y, Z done, right? It's, it's, they're not seeing the connection between if I just hire the best person I can afford, or maybe, maybe even reaching beyond that, hire somebody you don't think you can afford. It's going to push you to to build the business and grow the business to support all these wonderful employees. And I I know that might be a hard uh, mindset to to take in, but it, it's it really can really accelerate your growth when you start to look at it that way. Look at it more about how rewarding it is to build a team versus you being the 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 leader of client service <laughs> be about growing a team and they will be about client service and it'll start to be 
you talk about getting time back, you know, you got people who can really do the things that you don't do or duplicate yourself and how great you are and some of the people. Yeah. I think a lot of times it's, it's understanding how, how much you can really get back from investing the most you can there. It's a good point. And when done, you, you it's like you say, you, you're actually building the future today versus, oh, geez, someday I'll be able to. You're saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with that. And you get there a lot faster. You know, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's fear. It comes back to fear. Mm-hmm. You've likely worked with clients that had to go through that and take that fear. How do they, how do they overcome that? It's like, yeah, there's a bigger mm-hmm. investment. What if it doesn't work out? Yeah. How do people get over that? Yeah. Oh, man, that is, <laughs> how long do we have? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you got to get down to what is really going on in terms of money mindset. What are the belief systems that are keeping them from seeing the road in front of them and how how quickly it can happen for them? Um, I think people take calculated risk a lot of times. You know, going back to the idea that we're talking about bookkeepers, um, and I, just like I would never stereotype every musician in the world, I'd never stereotype every bookkeeper in the world, but there are a lot of common themes around bookkeepers to be very sort of planned and, and attention to detail and potentially risk averse, right? Cause you're, <laughs> that's part of what you're doing as a bookkeeper. And so you have to almost like reverse a little bit of that and say, I got to I got to take some risks here. I have to have some faith, right? The opposite of fear is, is really faith which is not an easy thing to build. That's a, that's why I was saying a lot of times coaching becomes life coaching no matter what, because you've got to get into the mind and really start to see that, 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 that your belief system is basically what's holding you back and creating that fear. It's very interesting. You know, we, we often talk about what to do in any area, marketing, sales, systems, all of that on this show, we talk about it, but it's kind of an interesting take is, hey, you know what, before you even start hiring, the, the problem might be us, the owner, before we've even begun to hire. Oh, gosh, yeah. Step number one is always to know yourself. Always. I mean, you if you don't know where what, what it is you really, and I'm going to use the three words again, what you really want, know, and do right? Yourself. How do you know what you're going to need to delegate to everyone else? And having a vision that you can communicate, having a brand. And when I say a brand, I'm not talking about a logo and colors. I'm talking about what do you stand for? What do you not tolerate in the world? What impact are you trying to make here? What values are you going to adhere to no matter what, right? That kind of stuff that you can talk about, even just in a job description. I've worked with people where I looked at the job description. I'm like, why would anybody want to apply to this job? And then we, we start talking about their brand and sprinkling in all these beautiful things they, they know and believe about, about what they're doing. And all of a sudden, somebody's like, I just called because your job description. I was like, I, I just needed to uh, you know, even just meet you. This is so great what you're doing. So I think it's so important to, to get excited about you know, your, your passion and, and your expertise and, and really what you want to build in a team. Mm, so true. So true. Let's talk a little bit about stress, conflict, burnout in the workplace. And you you talk about blind spots that perpetuate this. Yeah. <laughs> I, there are so many different root causes of these kinds of things. Some of them are very emotional. Some of them are assumptions that we're making, which oftentimes come down to building the relationships, having open communication, having clear expectations set uh, up front, like I said before. There are other things to learn from a skills perspective in terms of being able to listen to the things people are saying and read between the lines around what kind of energetic like what kind of energy they're resonating at. How do you move them to a higher level of engagement? There's, 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 it's almost like an art to it. But then there are other things like I use assessments that assess how someone works when they're in their highest level of productivity, when they're in their stride. Uh, I'm a Colby certified expert. And using some of these assessments in a very objective way, in a very non-emotional way, is some of the first things I do with people because you can take the emotion out of it and you can just see the basic 
concept of how someone works. And you can also assess how you need someone to work to fill in for your gaps or to fill in for whatever the role is. So there are many different ways to to look at it. And you'll notice in what I just said, I talked about emotion, which is, you know, really sort of uh, what somebody wants. And I talked about the Colby piece, which is what somebody does. What I didn't talk about is skill, which is the resume, right? So a lot of times I'm looking at with people, the other pieces a resume is pretty straightforward. You can kind of test people on cognitive pieces and understand, you know, if they're able to to do things. I shouldn't say do, but to know things. It's it's it gets a little bit deeper when you're looking at emotions and, and cognitive skills, which is that doing drive. Let me know if that makes sense. <laughs> what I just it, said. It does. It does. And yeah. I mean, this is the thing that's it's so big all these yeah. pieces happening. And I mean, if you think about preparing your, your workplace for people who are not going to have these things, I mean, that comes back to the way the, the owner is thinking uh, and, and who they are and, and who they stand for that, that then these have to be considered. Yeah. And the other thing too, I want to say in terms of like one of the biggest mistakes is just trying to hire really fast and, and what happens a lot of times is people, they realize, oh my God, I just need someone. I just need someone. And, and, and the realization happens and they're, they put it off. They put it off. By the time they hire somebody, they're just like, it's just like they pull the trigger on some person that happens to be there because they just need someone so bad. They feel like all they just need is a body to do the work. And it's just so horrible because you're desperate. Most likely with that energy, you're going to attract somebody who's desperate. I mean, like energy sort of attracts, I believe. And there's a lot of people out there that just want to get out of jobs or just feel like they need a job. So now you've got, it's the the, the way that you're hiring is so intrinsically based in fear and, and based in desperation. So it's like really taking the time, even if you feel like you need, you needed somebody three years ago or yesterday or whatever it is, still even so take the time to really assess what it is you need and who the people are coming through your door. Try to attract the people you can't. Don't just throw a resume out there on one of the big sites and hope someone's going to bite, right? Go out and, and find that person. You know, just like we were talking about with clients being referrals, being such a big piece of it. Who knows the person you want to hire? Go talk to them. Who knows that person? Where do they hang out? Just like marketing and going out there and finding a client. Um, you're going to feel so much better if you talk to somebody who's like, oh my gosh, this person's available. They're so great. I can vouch for them. They they do this and that. I, they worked with me on this. You know, give them a call rather than, you know, 1,800 people who clicked on a, on a resume because they're desperate for a job. And now you've got a billion resumes coming in and no idea how to, how to differentiate one from the next, except a resume, <laughs> maybe, mm. Mm. <laughs> right? You started talking about, you know, knowing yourself. Let's talk about assess, assessing other people. You you are a big believer in Colby assessments for hiring, improving teams, and developing strong leadership. Tell us about that. Yeah. I think, again, starting with the self, if you take this assessment, it, it's possible you could take it and be like, ah, cool. Tell me something I don't know. Right? And, and it's great. It just reaffirms what you already know about yourself. If that's the case, usually what happens is where the realization comes into play, where the real aha happens is when you realize like not everyone is going to work the way you do. And if you expect someone who, you, who you're directly reporting to, to work like you and you hire somebody completely different, your, your risk of conflict goes way up. Or if you're expecting somebody to do things outside of the way you work and you hire somebody exactly like you because that conversation went great because they sound exactly like you, and now you've got a problem. So that's number one. The second thing that happens, again, starting with the entrepreneur or the hiring manager, they assess themselves and they go, oh my gosh, I'm working outside of my, my MO. I'm working outside of my strengths all the time. And now I see why I'm so stressed out. These are the things I need to get off my plate Right. And it's like this moment of like, oh, wow, I need to get this stuff off now. And all of a sudden the world opens up in terms of their own productivity. Their stress levels can go down if they hire the right person to take on those other tasks. It's just one of the most beautiful the, the appreciation you have for somebody who does something so different from you. In, in my own world, I'll give you an example. I'm not great at bookkeeping. 
<laughs> and if you look at my Colby MO, I can tell you, it basically tells you, you're not going to be great at bookkeeping. I mean, sure, I can white knuckle it and I'm smart and I can learn how to put numbers into buckets, right? I mean, it's, it's, but it was not smart for me to be doing my own bookkeeping, which I was. When I hired a bookkeeper who does things very different from me, I knew, not only knew, okay, this is going to work out great, but also I knew that I had to change the way, my expectations, that she wasn't going to be like me and that there could potentially be conflict. Um, And so it's really all about awareness in the end, like knowing how to avoid conflict, knowing when to communicate, how to communicate, when to collaborate. Not everybody has to be working with each other all the time. It's such a big misnomer that it's all about always being in each other's stuff. Sometimes we just need to be in our own lanes. But this kind of assessment can tell you that. And it can tell you it in a very objective, very clear cut way. And it's also EEOC compliant. So you can use it for hiring, which I think is also a beautiful, beautiful thing. Companies have seen you know, retention rates go down. I mean, just, I'm sorry, retention rates go up. Um, <laughs> it's not quite the opposite. Retention rates go up and uh, I should say attrition rates go down. And so I think it's, it's, um, it's a great tool. And, and so the, you mentioned that it's like, you use it, it's like a benchmark for yourself and then you're comparing, well, what are, what are the pieces that uh, are needed for like what what would what would an assessment or or the outcome of an assessment look like for a, a key person in your organization? That's it's another tool that can be used to help people navigate the decision making process of who to hire into their business. Yeah, and it gives you some really quick wins, some really quick strategies. If you're the reports that can sort of compare your two ways of working will tell you immediately, here's how what you don't need to do with this person. Here's what you do need to do with this person to avoid conflict. I mean it's a very cut and dried strategies that come out of it. It's it's I mean I've seen I've I've been brought into conflict resolution situations where another coach brought me in because it, she was like these people are having such a hard time. I've been coaching them for a year now. I think this might be a cognitive issue. I want you to come in and do Colby with them. And as I was reading through their comparison report, they were like, are you a psychic? (laughs) They literally said that to me. I was like, no, I'm not a psychic. I'm reading right here what it says on this report. Um, And they're like, wow, yeah, this is exactly what we do. And what was interesting was, it, it was the it was literally the final straw. They looked at it and said, "Oh yeah, this is not going to change. This is how you are. This is how I am, and we're butting heads because we're expecting it to change, and it won't." So they parted ways in a very light, easy way, without blaming each other. And I think that's a great outcome, even though that wasn't necessarily what they'd been hoping for. At least it finally gave them the answers of like, "This is never going to be what either of us wants." or expects. Um, so I know, you know, again, <laughs> you don't always get the outcomes you want in life, but they're for you in the end. Some, some of them are the best ones that can happen. And that's, that's the, that's the key thing. I mean, that realization that this isn't going to change. I mean, there's a lot of relationships out there that probably need to come to that realization. Uh, and as an assessment like this helps, it does it help in like a small, like what if it's a small organization? Many of our listeners are in small organizations, I mean, you've mentioned individually, it's valuable just for one person. So I would imagine it would be for a small firm of one or two people. Yeah. I mean, I think it's almost more important, you know, working in very large teams, like Fortune 500 companies and things like that myself. I mean, if somebody's not pulling their weight, you usually have someone else to pick up the slack. Not that that's a great thing. Like, well, it is a great thing if you understand why and how. Sometimes it turns into a, a you know, an, an issue. But you have enough people to kind of be like, all right, we'll just shift, whatever. But if you have, you know, one or two people or you're hiring your first person, this is probably even more important than for the big, huge teams. Um, because of that, I mean, you. here's the thing. A lot of business owners... They bootstrap, they wear a lot of hats, they do a lot of things. There is no one in the world who can do everything. So they end up in a lot of stress, right? When you hire somebody and you're like, I just need somebody really smart and you're thinking, I'm just going to make this person wear all the hats, you better believe that person's not going to stay there for very long unless they feel like they can't find any other job or you're paying them a gazillion dollars or so. I mean, there's maybe some instances, but they're probably not going to stay there very long because you're expecting them 
to have some sort of motivation to work outside of their brain, outside of their strengths, outside of what they probably want to be doing all the time. And I really dislike the idea of praising people for, you know, wearing all the hats all the time or always taking one for the team and all this kind of thing, because it, it, it does in the end, it, people won't stay. So you can, and especially as a business owner, you can't expect the person who's working for you to have as much skin in the game as you and, and have as much of that desire to put themselves under stress for the sake of the company. So really making sure that you're clear, I need this right now. And you might need eight different people and you can only hire one. So you need to get clear on what your priorities are. Um, and that's part of the framework I work with people on. It's like, you know, you just can't just expect somebody to do everything because they have X amount of hours in the day and trade time for dollars. And that's, that's all it is really. It's, it's just not going to be sustainable. So true. I, I've, I've known owners that expected people to, own the business more than them without ownership, <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, it caused a lot of stress for them and, and anger and resentment and likewise on the other side. Uh, yeah. and, and it's such a, when you were talking about it, it's like, yeah, I've, I experienced the multiple hat thing all the time myself. And, you know, it's like handing somebody a big bag of stuff that they, that, that you don't want. Why would, who would want to have a big armful yeah. of what you don't want? Right. Uh, so kind of these things, which is another term that you talk about, which is conscious leadership. Say a little bit more about conscious leadership and why it's important to you. Mm, Yeah. So consciousness in general, right? Being, being conscious of, of your thoughts, being conscious of other people, being inquisitive, being curious, um, being receptive, right? All of that is part of consciousness. And uh, another uh, modality that I've studied in my coaching world is energy leadership, which is this idea of understanding where somebody is at an energetic level. And as you move up the levels of energy, you tend to be much more conscious. The idea is, even though we all judge, right? I, there, there's no one who's intrinsically non-judgmental, right? We all immediately judge the first thing we see, but we're not responsible for necessarily that first thing that pops into our head. But we are responsible to make decisions with, you know, where we don't immediately react to these judgments that we have in our head and to be more open and more inquisitive and to do things like assessments where like, well, let's let's drill down a little further and see how we can really help you and develop you or let's drill down even further on myself and see how I work or what do I really want? Right. It's it's really waking up a little bit, right? We, we all go through the motions all day long. There's a lot of people that kind of feel like robots all day long. We don't want the people, I should say my clients don't want the people working for them who are robots, right? It's like, let them wake up, let them be who they are, let them be authentic, let them have freedom, let them be fulfilled in their work and their life. And there's going to be a lot more reward at the end of that. It's going to be you know, managing your team can become one of the more rewarding things, like I said, than even serving your clients. So, so yeah, that's really where it comes from. And, e- and even, I should say, even just solopreneurs, okay, this idea of having that consciousness yourself around what it is you truly want, what you truly do, what you want to develop in terms of your own expertise and knowledge, right? Really sitting in a space of consciousness is going to serve you even if you're hiring vendors or 1099 people or whatever that looks like, it's, it's just a really great approach to anything in life. So true. So true. I absolutely love this. There's so many nuggets that we've come across through this episode and we're going to have to have come back because I think we could drill down, I drill down <laughs> in, in, into this, but you can really get, I can get that you'd be very powerful in helping people navigate through this whole concept of being great at your own conscious leadership and being a conscious leader and then bringing people into your organization that are, are going to take your organization to new levels and love doing it. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you pe- help people navigate through this. What, what are the services that you offer to help people do this? Yeah. So, I mean, really the, the main thing with ent- the entrepreneur themselves, the solopreneur or the, um, the business owner who's growing is is to work privately with me and really work on the things that are really 
at the forefront for you. Sometimes that is hiring. Sometimes it's like, let's just see what this looks like when we're just trying to hire a great person. And I think that's a great place to start because like I said, it's the greatest opportunity. Once you hire somebody, you, you then you've got what you've got. So it's like, yeah, <laughs> starting with hiring, great. We can do uh, a little VIP package around this, this first hire or the next hire that you have. But yeah, even with teams, uh, a lot of times I come in and do workshops to have everybody understand why they might be coming into conflict, how they can communicate better, collaborate better. So yeah, I think it's just um, just really great to um, to talk to the business owner and understand what it is they really need at the moment um, to customize something. Beautiful. Well, you you're a delightful person. I know that our listener would who, who's challenged with these situations. They're going to reach out to you. And if they did, what would be the best way for them to do that? Yeah, the best way to get in touch with me is just email me, (laughs) Andrea at leadwithharmony.com. I'll throw it out there. But also check out the website, leadwithharmony.com. There is a pop-up that'll be there that has a a job ad checklist. It's totally free. It'll give you an idea of how, you know, just like the basic ideas of what you would put in a job ad, which also is in line with the, the process for how I would take a look at what you really need and so on. Very cool. And then the other thing, I created a a code for your people successful bookkeeper is the code and it's for my delegation audio so i (laughs) it's a visualization to help you understand what you need to delegate and you can go to delegationvisualization.com and type in successful bookkeeper in the the coupon code to get it for free and it's basically i mean yes i'm a musician i come from the audio world i love audio so it's basically a visualization to get you into what it would feel like to have that great team and help you kind of work out what are the things I really need to delegate. And there are some worksheets in there and things like that. So that's sort of a little gift for your, your listeners as well. And then of course, go on LinkedIn, follow me there. I've got a newsletter there and all that good stuff. And um, I'm really excited about this visualization. I think that'll be very valuable for our listeners. So they, so they listen to this and it actually takes them on, on a journey of where they've delegated a bunch of stuff out of their, out of their, off their plate. Is that the idea? Yes. In the visualization, you have the team of your dreams. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> it's yeah, like going it's, on an <laughs> awesome Disney ride or something. I love it. Exactly. And I, I mean, I love audio. So I, I was like, oh, this is good. You know, this is sort of part of my, my world. So yeah, I hope people, I, you know, I think that's really cool. It. I don't think there's enough of that in, in, in the, like, that's the first time we've ever had a guest that's talked about having a resource like that, which is a audio visualization. And I'm excited about it. That's very cool. I can't wait for our listeners to let us know how they've, uh, what they found of it. And I'm going to go download it myself. Me too. Oh, that's so great. I love, I love being original. (laughs) That's cool. (laughs) I think you're onto something there. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Andrew, this has been great. Of course, we'll have all those links in our show notes, but I want to thank you uh, for your generosity on behalf of our listener, for you coming and sharing your wisdom and knowledge and for the free gifts that you're giving away to them. Thank you so much for doing that. Yes, and thank you so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. Pleasure is all ours, and thank you. And uh, with that, we wrap another episode of the Successful Bookkeeper Podcast. To learn more about today's wonderful guest and to get access to all sorts of valuable free business building resources, you can go to thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Until next time, goodbye. You've been listening to The Successful Bookkeeper with Michael Palmer. For more information and to download the resources mentioned in this episode, please visit us at thesuccessfulbookkeeper.com. Thank you for listening.